Welcome to this uh, first series of inaugural lectures um, of this semester. It's also the first time since almost two years that we can gather like this. Um, so it's also the good moment, I think, to, to pick up with presentations and to um, give the floor to our new colleagues to present their research. Over the last two years, uh, we have been quite active in finding new uh, professors uh, within the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Uh, over the last two years, seven colleagues have started um, and they will present their research today, next week, and also uh, later on towards the end of April uh, during a short presentation and maybe more important, after the presentation, we will also invite you to a reception where you can better learn your new colleagues uh, and have an informal chat. And in the end, that is what science is all about. Not. So today we will kick off and uh, there will be two presentations, one of uh, Anouk Borst and the second one of um, uh, Arthur Porthuis. Um, and Anouk will kick off. Yeah. So Anouk um, obtained a bachelor degree in earth sciences in 2009, a master degree in petrology and economic geology. That's modern media, 2012, both in Amsterdam. So um, coming from the Netherlands, but then you moved uh, to Denmark, uh, worked for the geological survey of Denmark uh, and obtained a PhD in 2016 at University of Copenhagen. Uh, you worked um, in Greenland, quite fascinating place. Um, but um, since you, um, after you obtained your PhD, you went to, to St. Andrews University in Scotland. But um, now you're here at KU Leuven on a very special uh, mandate. And uh, in fact, Anouk is the first colleague in the department, also one of the first colleagues uh, at the university on a so-called FETWIN mandate. And FETWIN, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, type of mandate, it's, uh, it's a cooperation between the Belgian universities and the federal scientific institutes. Um, it's a program which is launched by the Belgian Science Policy uh, in order to strengthen the cooperation between the scientific institutes in Belgium and the universities. And so, Anouk, you started um, last year, I think the 1st of April, yes. uh, 21, um, as a 50% tenure track uh, assistant professor within the geology division uh, here uh, in the department at KU Leuven, but also as a senior researcher at the Royal Museum for Central Africa. And uh, in fact, there are already very long standing cooperations between uh, the museum uh, and the geology division, and with this, um, mandate your position, um, we will further strengthen, in fact, this cooperation. And Anouk will focus uh, in particular on the um, metallogenic properties of various rocks within Central Africa. So you will work uh, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, in particular, also on rare earth elements, uh, which are very important, uh, as many of you know, uh, you need these rare earth elements for mobile phones, for all types of batteries. So if you make the switch from fossil fuels to um, electrical cars, we need batteries and we need all these rare earth elements. And knowing where we can find these, how to um, extract these also in a sustainable way, and that's also something where you will be focusing on, in close collaboration with people um, in the region is of utmost importance, I think, for the next uh, decades. So we are very pleased um, that you can work on this project, uh, that you can develop this research line. Uh, and I think you're of course, the person who can best explain to the audience what exactly your research is about. So Anouk, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. 
And can you hear me all right? Is it not too loud or okay? Uh, and also thanks uh, to everyone who is watching online. I can't see who is logged in online, but I hope you can. I am within the camera or I stay within the camera zone. Otherwise, uh, maybe send someone a message. Um, as you can see, I brought a, a few rocks, but this room is bigger than uh, I thought it was going to be. So you might not be able to see it that well, but uh, maybe afterwards during the reception, you can have another look. Um, so yes, as uh, Gert said, I will be um, performing research on Central Africa mostly, and specifically I'm interested in how uh, economic deposits of uh, metals and minerals form uh, by geological processes. Uh, but I know this is a very varied group of people uh, with different backgrounds. Uh, not all of you are geologists, or most of you are not. I think the geologists I see are mostly on that side. There's one, <laughs> all right. Some hands up, okay. Uh, this talk is not for you, so you can leave the room. <laughs> uh, no, there's also a lot of geographers in here in my family. So um, I, m my main uh, purpose today is to explain to you uh, why geology is so fascinating uh, and why it's important to all of us and specifically for the uh, green energy transition. Uh, that's the, the minerals I will be talking about a lot. So uh, some of you fa family members with the geologists uh, in, in the family might have asked themselves this question, uh, the following two questions uh, several times, and that is what, what on earth, what is it about rocks that makes them so, uh, geologists so fascinated in them? Uh, well, what can you, what do, what do we see in them? And also, what have rocks ever done for you? Uh, hopefully, after the, the next 30 minutes, you'll have a better understanding of, uh, of both of these, uh, these questions and why uh, some people like to get up very personal uh, with, with these rocks. There's the Olan sitting. Sorry, I'm just shining my laser at you. <laughs> the Olan sitting right there. Uh, all right. So the first reason, of course, is that they can be very pretty. And uh, for this, I wanted to turn off the light in the room. Is that possible? Can I do that? Can you do that? Just very shortly, uh, because I actually brought some of these rocks that have very uh, rare properties or rare properties, not that rare, actually. Uh, some have really cool properties and you'll see in a minute uh, what I mean by that, as you can see on the screen also. Uh, is that they are luminescent under UV light. And uh, the reason for they do that is, is quite complicated. It's in the, in the crystal structure of the mineral uh, where certain elements are, are excited by the UV light that I'm now shining on it, uh, and that makes them glow uh, a certain light. So we have green ones. These are zinc ores. Uh, this is a uranium ore. It's not the uranium mineral, though, that is uh, luminescing. Beryllium minerals, yellow, red, lots of colors. So this is pretty cool. But actually, I don't I want to talk too much about those rocks. I want to talk about this light that I'm holding to make them luminous. Can we put them? Could put the back uh, the lights back on. Thanks. So just a simple household item like this, uh, a UV light, contains lots of components. First, we have the casing that is probably aluminum, uh, aluminium. I'm European, not American. <laughs> uh, lithium batteries. The star of the show. Of course, we're going to need a lot more lithium batteries soon with all the electric, electric vehicles that we would like to replace the current uh, cars with. Uh, there's also in this, in this glass here, there's rare earth elements uh, doped in the glass that filter out some of the other light uh, length, wavelengths. So just to make this light bulb, we're going to need rocks from different places all over the world that are mined somewhere from rocks like this. So we have there's copper in there too, copper, iron ore, lithium ore, and rare earth ore coming from different places somewhere around the world they have to be dug up from the ground otherwise we could not make a lamp like that same goes for everything in this room that did not grow on a tree or uh, on an animal or something so you'll understand the importance of geology hopefully uh, but it's everywhere in our daily lives so very simply put 
Uh, of course, we care about rocks. That's the first thing. Uh, you might have, be lucky enough to have a nice slab of, of granite or uh, limestone in your kitchen, or you can see it on the floor in the, um, in the train station or uh, wherever you look, you'll see nice natural stones and granites. So the rocks are a combination of minerals uh, in different textures and formed in different places. The rocks are this made up of individual minerals, which we can also mine for different reasons. Uh, for example, gemstones, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, but also industrial minerals like clays, uh, gypsum, etc. But then the minerals are composed of individual elements, uh, including the metals. So to get iron, we have to extract a mineral called hematite from a rock like a bended iron formation. There goes a lot of processing in extracting just the iron from that rock. And uh, for some of these metals, the metals occur in very low quantity. So it's really complicated to extract the minerals or the elements from the rocks, from the minerals and from the rocks. Uh, but another way to look at this, uh, we geologists think about these things all the time, uh, but you can look at elements, minerals and rocks as the letters making up the words and making up the books. And what we geologists try to do is understand the language that the rocks are telling us about the history of the Earth. All right, so my research specifically uh, is in the field of what we call petrology, mineralogy and geochemistry. Uh, petrology is the study of, of rocks. Um, uh, and this is literally the same division, rocks, minerals, elements uh, to geochemistry. So I basically read the history of magmatic rocks, particularly, uh, and their associated fluids and how they form mineral deposits that we can potentially mine if they're present in high enough quantities to make it economic. Uh, I'm trying to understand how the magmas form in the first place, where they form, how long they, it takes for them to evolve as they go up through the crust, uh, and how the fluids affect the mineralogy, and how that influences where the metals are sitting, how they're distributed, and how we can extract them from the rocks. Uh, and I specifically, I'm interested in those uh, metals that we call critical metal deposits. Excuse me. Uh, so, uh, as Kert already mentioned, I've previously worked uh, in Greenland, uh, mostly that's where my PhD was focused, where I looked at a uh, big deposit of rare earth elements, but also I've looked at uh, similar um, magmatic intrusions in Brazil, Angola, Madagascar and Botswana, which was a diamond, uh, diamond project. Uh, but currently I will focus more on Central Africa. The processes remain the same, the min minerals are a bit different, but much of the, the processes and the techniques that we're using are, are, are the same. So I mentioned the word critical metals and what uh, do we mean with a critical metal? Uh, that is essentially a metal that is under threat or at risk of supply. And that is of course relative to whom we're talking about. So uh, critical metals, we can look at it from a European perspective and all the metals that we consider critical are those that we are importing from places that are unstable, okay? Uh, so because of the global technological development and the transition towards renewable energies, we're gonna need a lot more of a lot more different elements. Uh, as you can see on this timeline, uh, sorry, yes, my mouse, uh, yeah. B before the Industrial Revolution, we didn't need that many metals. Iron was by far uh, the most important. And the more technologies become available, the more uses we find for different metals. Uh, so this is a, a map showing where we're sourcing uh, many of the metals that we're importing into Europe uh, from all over the world. And the key thing here about metals being critical is that uh, certain elements are completely monopolized by certain economies. And this is super relevant today, or you can all imagine uh, we're talking about Russian gas right now. Uh, we're super dependent on Russian gas, but it is the same thing for metals. Uh, for uh, good examples are, for example, the, uh, oh, moving back, yeah. The rare earth elements, uh, which have been 
uh, in the news for over a decade now. Uh, and that was because China was producing all of the rare earth elements. About 97% of the rare earth elements came from China. Uh, everyone else was then starting to, to panic about having enough access to these metals. Uh, but the same is true for, for uh, niobium. Most of it is coming from Brazil. Uh, cobalt, a lot of it coming, is coming from the DRC, etc. So vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable supply chains and um, uh, lead to high supply risk. And that's when we consider them critical. So this is the list from 2020 for Europe just uh, from a European perspective, uh, and we plot them uh, by supply risk versus economic importance. And everything in the upper right corner is, uh, or plotted in red here, is what we consider critical. And I'll just highlight a few that are coming from, uh, or the one in orange are coming mainly from China, uh, the ones in green, cobalt and tantalum from the DRC, and then lithium is currently mostly coming from Chile. Uh, and uh, I can't uh, emphasize this enough. Uh, if we are all we're all agreeing that we have to move away from fossil fuels uh, to avoid further uh, global warming, and that we want to go to the image on the on the right towards renewable energy transition. This looks all all great. Everybody buy an electric car if you have the money for it. Uh, the government might give us some some help to buy one. But we have to remember or realize that re uh, eliminating fossil fuels does not go without mining. It, it, we, we simply cannot produce the electric cars uh, that are needed without mining the metals from the ground. There aren't enough metals in, tr in, in circulation. We cannot do it from recycling because they are not used yet. This is really important. But again, we have to put things into perspective. Uh, this is a nice plot showing how many metals were mined in one year in 2019 all over the world. And it shows, uh, of course, iron ore being the main commodity, uh, the biggest commodity. And then uh, we have aluminium and manganese, quite uh, large volumes of that. And then here, the much, much smaller volumes of the tech and the precious metals. So we're talking smaller volumes of actual ore that is being extracted, but their extraction is difficult and it requires a lot of rock to be extracted from the, uh, from the ground. So all of these things are important to keep in mind. Okay, now we're going to uh, a bit more into the geology side of things. So uh, a basic geochemistry lesson uh, for everyone to understand how magmas evolve from, from one composition to another composition. And the key thing is that certain elements, uh, metals, like the rare earth elements and lithium, are considered, or what we consider, incompatible elements. I will explain it. Uh, so these are elements that have either high charge and are very small, or quite big in radius and have a low charge. But the key thing is that they do not easily fit into the crystal structure of minerals rock forming minerals in magmas. Uh, you can see that on that on that diagram. Uh, if you stick a really big element like the purple one, oh, trying to get my mouse there, uh, into a crystal structure that is made up of the smaller blue balls, it's going to distort the crystal structure. The same is true if you try to squeeze in a smaller element. Uh, it's not too happy. It's not uh, um, thermodynamically stable. So those elements, the purple and the brown ones, prefer to stay in the magma when a crystal forms from the magma. It's like sticking a potassium into a small uh, well, olivine crystal. Uh, the geologists will get that one. So uh, what happens to these elements is when a magma is cooling and crystallizing as it comes from the deep mantle to the Earth's crust, that those elements become gradually enriched in the magma uh, because they stay in the magma and other elements are being pulled out into the minerals. Uh, so it's basically like uh, eating, prefer having a strong preference for the, the, the white and um, uh, black layered licorices. This is probably a very Dutch example, but my mom will recognize this uh, because what you end up with at the end is just uh, the harder, not so sweet licorices that uh, stay behind. Uh, this is basically what we call fractional crystallization uh, of magmas. 
In an actual diagram for magmas, uh, you could look at it like this. We have an initial magma formed deep in the magma mantle that's typically rich in iron and magnesium. Crystals then start to form as it cools and crystallizes. These crystals sink. Uh, if they're denser than they melt, they, they can also float. And then you, you get rocks like this, uh, where you can, I don't, you can probably not see it from this far, but you see the horizontal uh, crystals that have settled in, in the same orientation, very much like this crystal cumulate uh, you see on the other side. But as we go, the magma changes its composition. And this is also the reason that we see so many different types of volcanoes over the world. So the first example is of a primary magma, which is iron magnesium rich. Uh, is what we call a basaltic magma. Uh, you could just visit those in, in, uh, in Iceland. Uh, not very um, dangerous to see because it's not that explosive. You can just watch them. Uh, Iceland or Hawaii are good examples of basaltic magmas. When magmas become more silica rich, more evolved, so on that side of the diagram, uh, we talk about often granitic magmas, much more silica rich, uh, gas rich, and these become really uh, explosive when they reach the surface, the gas exhausts, and it's really sticky magma and it produces these enormous uh, gas uh, clouds with ash, etc. On top of that, these different magmas occur in different places in te different tectonic settings. Uh, depending on how much time the magma has to evolve on the way up through the, through the mantle and the crust, uh, and whether it's in an oceanic plate or on the, on the continents. So in these, uh, this case, two examples, the basaltic magmas would form uh, where plates are moving apart, where oceanic plates are moving apart. The magma is formed quite shallow in the mantle and immediately erupts to form new oceanic crust, which is made of basalt. Uh, the other type, the granitic, however, are found in continental settings uh, where plates are colliding and where the magma has time to evolve and reach the sticky silica rich uh, composition. Uh, so my research is really focusing on ore deposits associated with continental style uh, magmatism, uh, both where we have um, continents rifting apart and uh, in more orig orogenic settings. So there's two types of, of examples uh, that are, uh, of evolved magmas that I work on, and both host different types of ore deposits. And the first one are the alkaline magmas and the carbonatites, which form when uh, continental crust is starting to pull apart. Magmas are formed in the, in the mantle, and they uh, form volcanoes in, in a rift setting. And we have an active uh, example of that in Africa, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, but these type of magmas uh, are typically enriched in niobium, uh, phosphorus, which we use for fertilizer, uh, niobium for stainless steel, and the rare earth elements. So these are a primary target for rare earth elements, uh, other deposits around the world. We've done a lot of exploration for commoditized all over the world to find uh, rare earth element uh, deposits, but these are very complex. I will get back to those in a, at the end. Uh, then the granites and the uh, associated deposits, which we call pegmatites and quartz veins, uh, these typically form where we have collision or just after collision. So thick continental crust, uh, melting of the, of, the, of the crust forms these, these silica rich magmas. And these provide the world's our main resource for tin, uh, tantalum, which is uh, uh, used in electronics, uh, tungsten or wolfram uh, in light bulbs, for example. And then they, they are just becoming a potential source for lithium as well. Okay, so moving on to Africa. Um, Africa is a great place to study mineral deposits because there are so many of them in different settings. Uh, and Africa is composed of uh, some very old um, pieces of crust, which are shown here on this simplified map uh, on the left here in the red regions. These are the oldest parts of the crust, which we call cratons. Uh, then around that are bits where th those old pieces of crust have smashed onto others uh, to form younger crust. And then the youngest crust is the, uh, is the, the uh, purplish cover, uh, so the Kalahari sands and etc. 
but it's really uh, those old pieces of crust that we're interested in to find the mineral deposits, and I'll show you why that is. Uh, just to go to the Africa Museum, which is where I'm also uh, based half time, as Gert said. This is uh, one of the displays you can see there in the mineral room. Uh, if you go, if you are, uh, if you've ever visited the museum, you might have seen this already, and it shows um, the mineral deposits uh, scattered around mainly Congo and, and Rwanda, Burundi. And you see uh, a big blob of red dots, and th that's tin, tantalum, and uh, uh, tungsten deposits. They're all sitting together. They're associated with the same type of rocks. Then there's also the copper belt here in Zambia and southern uh, uh, Congo. You have uh, the, all the green ones. That's copper deposits, uh, copper co uh, cobalt deposits. Uh, what else? We have the diamonds here in pink which are actual diamond deposits uh, coming from kimberlites, which come through young crust. If I put the geological map back on it, which you can do on that display, uh, you can see that it's these different ore deposits are associated with specific regions of the uh, or ages of the crust, and particularly the, uh, the orange ones, which I'll look into a bit more. But when I say old, I really have to put things in perspective a little bit. Whenever you're talking to a non-geological uh, audience is that uh, when a geologist says it's recent, we talk about a few million years. I think the, the dinosaurs died fairly recently. Uh, what I'm working with is a, a thousand billion years ago. So uh, let's look at this. I like this diagram because it um, just gives us a sense of how long the history of the Earth is. Uh, if we think of humans, uh, so this is today, and we go back around, uh, back in time following the spiral. 11,000 years ago, this is when humans start to appear. We are, we're, we're just babies, really. Uh, then going back in time, 65 million years ago is when the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, other people in the room might tell a lot more, uh, much more about the reasons why they why they died. It might be an asteroid, maybe not. Uh, still debated, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, so the dinosaurs, we have to go much, much, much further uh, to the Paleozoic, which is, and all the way down to where there was no life on Earth, or uh, at least not on the continents, but in the seas, to the Precambrian area. Still have to go further to reach a thousand million years ago when there was not much around, not much uh, life going around. But this is a really interesting period geologically. It's when one of the periods, this, this happened multiple times, that the continents were all assembling into one big supercontinent and then pulling apart again and then forming another supercontinent. And every time that happens, you have mountain building events, rifting events, and these magmas start to appear with associated with the mineral deposits. Then all the way back, the Earth uh, history is, uh, is actually four and a half billion years old. Um, but yes, I'm working on a daily basis with stuff that is a billion years old. Going back to today in Africa, we see uh, the continent is actively being pulled apart. And we can learn a lot from that in terms of the types of magmas that we see associated uh, when, when, the mag when the crust is pulling apart. So here you have a view of um, uh, Eastern Africa. Uh, with um, Lake Victoria here, and you see that there is a rift zone uh, coming from the Red Sea uh, and in the Afar region. Then there's two arms of rifts that go around the, the Tanzania Craton, uh, and these red bits are being pulled apart. And this region, this entire region, is scattered with volcanoes. Two examples are Aldoyo Lengai and Yeragungo, and some of my colleagues here, uh, Olivier Namur, and some of the PhDs here are working on some of these volcanoes, uh, which are very strange in composition, what we call a carbonatite. So it's almost purely made of carbonate, uh, which is super rare, where normal silicate uh, magmas are made of silica. Uh, so this is an active situation where we find alkaline magmas, but the mineral deposits are formed potentially at kilometers depth in these magma chambers sitting below the, the volcanoes, which of course we can't access for, they're no good to us for the mineral resources. 
So what do we need? How do we get to those, those old, uh, uh, well, I already said it, uh, the deep mineral deposits that are sitting underneath these volcanoes? Uh, there's only one way, and that is by millions of years of erosion. So we take away that top four kilometers of crust and exposing those rocks. These rocks that were once formed four kilometers, eight kilometers depth are now just at, exposed at the surface for us to mine. It's pretty cool. So we can study, by studying these rocks, we can see the 3D um, structure that is sitting underneath the volcano, like sort of the plumbing uh, system of a volcano associated with all mineral deposits, which is uh, what interests me. So just to summarize the three main ore forming processes, how we distinguish between them. First of all, we have the magmas, the actual magmas crystallizing minerals, forming magma chambers. Uh, but then there's a lot of fluids going about as well. So these rocks tend to cook in their own juices. And in that process, the minerals can be completely replaced and the metals can become mobilized by the fluids associated with those uh, magmas at the final stages of crystallization. Uh, but then much later, when they become exposed at the surface, you have a third process and that is weathering at the surface. And weathering happens often in like a low pH, so you have the soil formation, uh, and the plant roots growing, and again this breaks down the minerals uh, which sometimes makes it much easier for us to access the minerals and sometimes makes it more difficult because it distributes the elements that we were interested in or it makes the minerals more difficult to extract. So I'll give you a few examples of these three processes from Central Africa and then that's the end. Uh, so tin, tungsten and tantalum, I already mentioned that uh, Congo, Rwanda are uh, key places for, for extraction from tin, uh, of tin, tungsten ore. Um, and they were associated with granites. Uh, so on this diagram uh, from Niels Hulsbos, you can see the granites being a place at about four, uh, eight to uh, 14 kilometers depth. Uh, then these final bits of melt that are become most enriched uh, in, in the el incompatible elements, uh, then escape the magma and the uh, magma chamber and they go into the surrounding rocks to form veins. And in these veins, we can see a zonation uh, from uh, certain elements as earth, certain elements start to crystallize out as the temperature decreases and as more fluids uh, come in also from the surrounding ocean rock. There's still a lot of questions. And for example, I have uh, Yolan that's doing a PhD trying to figure out, uh, work out the zonation and mineralization across this entire system in Rwanda. Uh, but the mineralization is very narrow. It's hosted in these veins. And what that looks like in the field uh, uh, can be this. And here you see such a very thick weathering profile that you see in, in Africa. Uh, this can be up to 50 meters thick. Uh, so the red, you have the red iron staining. Um, if I overlay uh, some note, notes on this, you have the soil then some alluvial cover, which is like mobilized by, by water, by rivers. Uh, and then the in-situ weathering profile as well, where you can still see some remnant layers in here. And then as you go deeper, you have the more the fresh, I mean, it's a billion years old, how fresh can it be? But the actual uh, original rocks, which were sediments. The, these veins that come off the granite, uh, hosting all the, those ore minerals are very narrow, as I said, it could be a meter wide. And the way uh, and, um, the locals or artisanal miners extract these uh, is by digging deep shafts or steep shafts to follow those veins. And those shafts are scattered around the country where they extract those minerals. But because the rock is so soft, they can extract them quite easily without any advanced techniques. You don't need uh, big, uh, big machines, it's just shovels. Uh, quite simple. Uh, uh, this is an example from, from one of the tunnels that we went in a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in the Musha area in Rwanda. And they're actually uh, digging these tunnels and then extracting the minerals by hand because they're heavier than the, the, uh, the remaining, the, um, the surrounding rock, the quartz, etc. So 
weighing it out and take the big chunks and that's the concentrate. The finer stuff is then concentrated using a shaking table uh, where they make use of the fact that the, the min minerals we're interested in are much heavier than the rest of the minerals. So you end up with the, with the heavy minerals, they end up on this side, the lighter minerals are washed out. Uh, so that's a bag of ore of tin of cassiterite and tantalum. Uh, some more artisanal style uh, where they have uh, don't have those more advanced techniques uh, like a shaking table and crushing um, equipment. They simply again uh, extract the rock, make these tunnels in this very soft uh, clay um, rich pegmatite. So uh, this is where the ore sits, the white stuff which has been completely weathered uh, thanks to recent weathering makes it easy to extract. And then they wash again, do the same, they do the same thing, but on a bigger scale uh, by just shoveling and washing the lighter minerals come down, the heavy minerals stay behind. And they do this over several steps uh, to end up with uh, the concentrate of tin and, and, and tantalum. So there's a lot of people uh, working in this, in this industry in uh, Rwanda and Congo. Uh, but if we go a little bit deeper below the weathered surface, then you end up with the with the pro with the proper hard rock, which uh, excites us geologists more because we can still see the mag magmatic textures and the magmatic minerals. Uh, so we had access to a drill cores, fresh drill, or new drill cores from Rwanda, which went 400 meters deep, and then you're well below the weathering surface. So we could see inside or deeper inside this uh, mineralized system for the first time, which is quite unique and we found, uh, or well they found, the, the company found meters and meters of lithium bearing pegmatites which are more proximal to the granite. Uh, so to extract lithium from, from that mineral, uh, so I'm holding a UV light on it by the way, that's why it's glowing sli uh, slightly orange, spodumene is also luminescent like those minerals. Uh, but that's a lot more, lot harder. You can imagine that this is not something that artisanal miners can do. This is, you need a company that has equipment, uh, you need to crush the rocks, etc., and then extract the spodumene, and then extract the lithium from the spodumene. It's a lot more difficult. Uh, the same is true for many rare earth deposits. Uh, for, uh, as for lithium minerals, is that the, the mineralogy is often very complex, and it completely depends, unlike tin and tantalum, which are easy minerals, they, they stay in the, in the soil um, and they're high uh, grade as well. The rare earth elements can be distributed in many different minerals and each one has to be processed in a different way. So even though we have loads of uh, deposits for both lithium or that have high concentrations of these elements, they might not be economic. That purely depends on where the metals are sitting in, which minerals. So this requires a lot of detailed mineralogical geochemical work uh, and integration with how they're extracting with the uh, geometallurgical processes. So that's my takeaways. Um, I hope I can convince you that uh, rocks have a lot to say. We can learn a lot about them, about earth history, and that they're also very relevant for relevant uh, in today's society, especially for if we are really wanting to move away from fossil fuels. We're going to need to do a lot more mining. Uh, we have to make sure that this is done responsibly, safe and clean, uh, and that we uh, yeah, uh, understand their distribution uh, and uh, develop better ways to extract the minerals from the, from the ores. So with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for being a nice audience, like the audience we had in Rwanda uh, when we did our field work. And I want to thank everyone uh, yeah, who's been a part of my past journey. Uh, I wouldn't be here without you, all my colleagues, friends, uh, uh, family, of course. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone for being here. Okay, thank you very much, Anouk. Um, I suggest to leave um, most of the questions to after the second uh, presentation on the reception, but if there is a very burning question right now for Anouk, then it is possible.
Yes, Jan. Well, pass you the microphone. Eh? Well, it's, it, what is urgent? Uh, <laughs> of, yeah. Well, thank you. Very interesting. No, I have a question. Uh, scientifically, it's very interesting for me, but the topic about resources, I, I've been working for decades on, on resources, but we are, we are in a transition. So when I start new projects with the people from metals department, they are focused on uh, recycling. So they say, OK, stop it. And uh, we need a period of transition of these uh, elements. But after a transition, the best thing for society if, is that every iPhone, every is just recycled. So that's the, that's the focus. But we need, of course, a transition period. Yes. So what is your opinion about this? Uh, well, there's a thing we refer to as the circular economy. This is the ideal, the, the dream, that there are enough resources in circulation uh, for us to create the electric vehicles. But today, that simply isn't the case. Uh, th those metals are not in circulation. I think to uh, replace just the car fleet that we currently have just for the UK. Give everyone an electric vehicle, take away their uh, fossil fuel based vehicle that requires more rare earth elements than have been mined in the last 20 years. That, that's, so that's just for the UK. So imagine I, I haven't we've I've been to conferences where they've done some back of the envelope calculations of how much would be needed. But I think by 30, 2030, uh, we're, we're going to need, I don't know, uh, eightfold of what we are currently producing. And that's only in 10 years from now. Uh, they simply aren't in production, and that goes for a lot of a lot of the metals, lithium uh, as well. And then the other thing is a lot of people are then working on making it easier to recycle. So, uh, but the problem with a lot of these metals is that we use them in so, such small quantities in the in the technologies, uh, like uh, in this just this example of of the light bulb or the, this glass, how are you going to recover the rare earths that are in there in PPM levels? Just PPM levels, parts per million to have enough effect. Um, but how are you going to recover that again? That's also a huge uh, problem. If you have coating of car, uh, copper uh, with a little bit of uh, niobium in, into it just to make it more uh, conductive or stronger, again, it's going to be very difficult to recycle. So. Yes, there we need to be more innovative in our um, how uh, we produce uh, the technologies, but and how we can then increase recycling. But we're nowhere near a circular economy. This is future uh, utop utopia, I think. But yes, we should work towards that. Does that then answer the question? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Anouk. So uh, I think it's time to, to move to the second uh, inaugural lecture of uh, Arthur Portas. Um, and in fact, um, in this transition period, Anouk was talking about also, um, I think it's good that we produce some more smartphones because that generates data, isn't it, Arthur? And you need data, uh, spatial data. Um, there is another link between the two. They both studied in Amsterdam, yet at a different <laughs> university. And Arthur is a geographer by training, human geographer. Um, but after obtaining his master's degree, he also left Amsterdam and went to the US, uh, obtained a PhD in Kentucky, um, making use of geospatial data that is collected uh, through uh, new technologies. Uh, and everyone is using uh, new technologies today. Um, many of you are leaving there um, or allow that your smartphone is, is uh, tracking where you exactly are. So generating spatial data. Many of you are running, cycling, also uh, tracking um, where you are exactly going to. 
And that offers a lot of opportunities to study spatial behavior. And that's one of the research foci of, of Arte. Now, after obtaining his PhD um, in Kentucky, I think 2015, he moved to Singapore, um, where he has been an um, assistant professor for a number of years. Then um, came this vacancy here in Leuven on big data and human environment systems already in 2018 or 19, I think. 20. But, uh, but in the end, with the whole COVID um, history, it took some time before you really started here in Leuven. So I think it was uh, June 2020 that you um, took the position here. Um, and well, you will explain better what exactly your research goals uh, are here. But it's about geospatial data, collecting lots of data and also visualizing it because um, it looks very easy um, to collect a lot of data, but you also have to manage it. And that's really a challenge. And you also have to find ways to visualize this. And in a way, um, we can call it modern cartography. Um, and that's quite interesting because 500 years ago, here in Leuven, we had Jacob van Deventer, Gemma Frisius, and Mercator, uh, who were very important um, cartographers at the time, leading cartographers, and yeah, still today, um, we're doing cartography here in Leuven. So we are very pleased that Arta joined uh, the Division of Geography and Tourism within the department. And Arta, I give floor to you to explain what exactly you will be working on here. Gladly. Thank you, Fred, for that wonderful introduction. Um, can everybody hear me? Not too loud? It sounds a little loud up here, but I guess it's okay. Um, thanks. Uh, everybody for being here, colleagues, uh, students, my family as well. Um, I'm very happy to be here today and Gert, I'm also very happy with your introduction because it segues very nicely into, into one of the things I want to talk about today. I think when people hear that I'm doing something with big data, I think often the association is that it's it's very new, it's very novel, there's lots of big jargon words, um, but in many ways the work that I'm doing today is really old work. Uh, it's work that has been going on in geography for at least 70 years. Now in geologic time, that's not that much, uh, but considering uh, a human lifespan, that, that is actually quite a long uh, period of time. And what I hope today is to give a little bit of a, an appreciation uh, about that kind of lineage and the work that we have been doing in geography, and then looking forward to the really exciting directions that some of these new data sets that, that Gert mentioned and geospatial technologies, uh, the exciting things that they enable. So before, hmm, let's see if I can get this technology to work. There we go. Uh, before I talk about my own research, uh, I wanna do a, a short sort of historical prelude um, starting with this machine that was on my, my title slide. Uh, and this machine uh, comes from 1958 and has the amazing name, at least to a cartographer, the Cartographatron. Um, and what this machine is, uh, it's a sort of homemade invention um, by a bunch of people working at the Chicago Area Transportation Studies in the 1950s. And what is happening in the United States in the 1950s is there is a lot of post-Second World War economic growth. With that growth comes suburbanization and of course a lot of traffic. Um, so cities all around the US are dealing with these tremendous traffic problems and they don't really know how to solve them in the beginning. So they start studying them uh, quite literally by doing surveys. Uh, what you see here on the right hand side are punch cards that are punched in based on the trips that people are taking. So you go into a city, you ask thousands of people basically to fill out for a week, where are you going, when, which mode of transportation are you taking, etc. But when you get these thousands and thousands of punch cards, you have to somehow analyze them. You have to make maps of them uh, to ultimately, hopefully, come up with a solution to this traffic problem. Now, in the beginning, people made um, maps like you see on the left here, basically showing the density of traffic. But if you're a traffic engineer and you have to construct a new road, you want to know exactly from where to where should I construct 
this road. Uh, and for that, you need information about the direction and the flow of traffic. And that was simply not possible with the cartographic techniques at the time. So when this study came to Chicago, uh, they decided to do something entirely new. They developed this machine, and I'll show a picture of it again in a minute, uh, to construct these types of maps. And what these types of maps are is their desire lines. And what they do is they literally plot a line for every single trip taken in the city. And of course, for a city like Chicago, that's millions and millions of trips on a day. So to do that in the 1950s uh, is quite a significant undertaking. Um, and what that allowed them to do, and you can kind of see it here on the, uh, on the right map, is that if you look through um, kind of the, uh, the hairs of your eyes, you, you can kind of see, okay, I can draw rows here, right? Uh, so this was really the foundation of the redesign of traffic in many American cities. Uh, maybe not always for the better, as we know now, um, but at least this is how partly this was done. And why I like this example is that not only was it a really creative solution to sort of build this computer to do this one study, uh, there was a lot of excitement around it as well. You see in these publications from that time, these little notes about how, in this case, they could do the entire data set of Chicago, about 10.5 million movements, and they could basically make a map of it in a matter of hours. Now, even today, doing such a thing is not an, an insignificant feat. And they could already do it in the 1950s. This initial excitement, sort of starting in the 1950s, then sort of bleeds into academia as well, and it bleeds into geography. And we get this whole movement that we now often call spatial science or the quantitative revolution. Basically, people thinking, what can we do with these computers? What can we do with quantitative representations of the world. Uh, so geographers start building models of cities, of countries, of flows of people, of physical processes as well. Um, a very exciting time. I can talk about this for hours. I won't do that. Uh, but I've written some things about this before with uh, with Matthew Zuck. So if you want to read more about it, you can check that. Uh, you can check that out. Um, we see that too in Leuven. Um, one of the advantages of being in an older institution uh, where people don't always clean, about, clean up their old books is that when you walk the hallways, you find all kinds of old syllabi, old issues of old journals. Uh, these are just some examples of, of work that was done right here in the 1960s and in the 1970s. I think especially the example on the right is really interesting, I think done under the um, a kind of mentoring of Professor van der Hagen by uh, Mason and the Rudder, basically building a computer system, a geographic information system, before we called these things geographic information systems already in the 1970s, using it to then combine data from different census years and look at the evolution of the Belgian population. Creating maps like this in the 70s, um, that look pretty similar to what we now make in map or something like that uh, several decades later. So not an insignificant feat. Um, and again, if you read publications from that era, you can kind of see it too in the, in the title here of this uh, chapter, right? New roads for cartography. There's a lot of excitement about what, what, might, we, what might we do with this. But the kind of love story Comes to, comes to an end, of course, as well. So the initial excitement um, makes way for um, a little bit of a split. So the people who like to do modeling, who like to use computers, they get a little overexcited. And the computer and the model becomes a kind of a goal in and of itself. Uh, and they lose sight of geography. And vice versa, geographers, say that the, the model people have gone too far and they turn kind of their backs to quantitative techniques and modeling. And we see that wave a couple of times through our recent history. We have computers and geography where we start with this integration and then we kind of split ways for a while. We've come back during the 1980s, 1990s, when the personal computer came about and many researchers got their own computer on their own desk. And we see a new wave of interest in computation, basically, um, that we now often call geographic information systems or GIS. This was also the time when 
ArcMap, for example, was born. But that too, uh, it couldn't last so long. I think geographers are kind of people that often look for a reason to have a fight, at least uh, they did certainly in the 90s. There is a series of very salty articles and commentaries in really serious academic journals from that time where basically people who do modeling, who do computers, and people who do not call each other names. Um, on the right here you see Neil Smith, uh, by then already a very famous human geographer, uh, basically saying that everybody who's doing GIS is complicit in the Iraq war. Uh, and with that subheading, GIS Uba Alles, the tone of the debate is, is very clear, right? So again, after the early 1990s, what we see is that there's a split. We have geographers doing geography, we have computer people, model people doing models. And I'm exaggerating a little bit here, um, but this is also when my own story starts. So my story, as Gert already mentioned, starts in Amsterdam at the other university in Amsterdam, the University of Amsterdam, and it actually starts in this building. This is on the Nieuwe Prinsengracht. Um, and, and what we see here is, I think, a physical representation of that split in geography. So when I started, and this photo is of course a little older than, than when I actually started there in the 2000s, urban geography, people who are doing urban geography, uh, were all the way located on the left of that building. People who were doing GIS, who were using computers to do geographic research, you couldn't put them further away. They were really at the edge of the building, like almost in the next building over. Um, and I was a little lost because I liked both of these things. I, I, I wanted to study cities, but I wanted to do it through GIS, through computation. Um, and that didn't really fit, it seemed. So that is one of the reasons why, indeed, afterwards, I moved to the University of Kentucky, um, which is housed in a really ugly, brutalist uh, building. Uh, it looks okay from the outside, but uh, for the PhD students uh, among us, if you think your office is bad right now, uh, PhD offices were in the middle of this building without any windows and also doubled as a tornado shelter. So uh, not so charming in that sense, but the intellectual life was very charming uh, because all the geographers in my department were doing computation, they were doing quantitative work, they were doing GIS, uh, but nobody called themselves a GIS person. It was just integrated in the day-to-day -day research practice of doing geography. And that is a trend that we are currently seeing. So we're currently seeing a renewed integration of computers, computation, and geography. Um, here we see the uh, last campus I worked at before coming here at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, which is by far the most photogenic campus I've ever uh, worked at. Although this new building uh, that we are in right now today um, it's quite nice to look at too, I must say. Uh, and what we, partly what we did there is um, start a new graduate program called Urban Science. And this is what we are currently witnessing, all these new terms, urban science, spatial data science, geographic data science. You can pick your jargon word, but basically what it means is that we're integrating again geography, uh, classic geographic questions, but computational methods and techniques to hopefully answer some of these questions. And I think that too is in the, in the title of my professorship. It's about big data, but it's about using big data to study interactions between humans and their environment. With that short kind of history, uh, I would now want to look a little bit more towards the future and uh, talk about what I think are four of the most kind of exciting developments in this field. So the first being software development, uh, the second being using all of this new data and these new methods to answer very old, very classic questions, and then finally the role of visualization and also the role of education uh, in all of this starting with software development, uh, because that might not be a given if you would uh, normally ask a geographer. 
Why is this so important? If you look at the picture in the, in the top left, this is a map made by Thorsten Hagerstrand, a quite famous geographer uh, working in Sweden in the 1950s, um, who was not hindered by computers per se in his thinking. And what we see here is we see a map, but it looks a little funny because this map is not plotting points as they are on the Earth's surface, but it is stretching and warping the map based on how people perceive distance. So it's a completely sort of different conceptualization of space, right? A concept that is very important for geographers. But in the 1980s and the 1990s, as social software developed, it was great at first because it enabled us to do all kinds of new analysis much faster, much easier, but it also constrained us. Uh, because basically we could only do the types of analysis that were baked into the software. And importantly, it was not us developing the software. It was, in this case, a company in Redlands on the west coast of the United States, a commercial company at that too, with maybe different interests and different priorities. And I think that tension has been very important uh, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, just to give you one example, my colleagues have been kind enough to um, bestow on me the honor of being the uh, internship coordinator. Uh, and one of the things I've noticed uh, just over the last year is that a lot of the geospatial companies in Belgium today, when they do location analysis, so when they advise companies on where they maybe should build a new mall or build a new location of their company, they still use car accessibility as their main criteria for doing this analysis. And why is that? Because calculating car accessibility is really easy. It's built into ArcGIS. Doing that same analysis for bikes or for public transportation is much more difficult and it's not built in. And that's partly our fault, right? Because if we as geographers think that is important, we should help build those tools, and we now have the knowledge and the techniques to, to do so. I like this example, just to put kind of a visual uh, under this. Uh, this is an example by uh, Nick Lally and Luke Bergman, who have built this prototype that they call geographical imagination systems instead of information systems. And what we see here is two locations on the Earth's surface that are seemingly very far apart. One is in Nevada, and the other one is in Pakistan. But these two locations are also connected at the same time, because this location in Nevada is where the drone operator is operating the drone from. And on the bottom, we see the exact location where the drone operator um, has executed a bombardment. So at that very moment in, in time, these two spaces are very much connected. Uh, and with their software, what they want to show is that we need different ways of visualizing of thinking about spatial processes. Now, we see that um, in kind of regular um, academic practice as well. We are building tools and today, many of us are doing research no longer with commercial software, but with the tools that are built by hundreds and thousands of other researchers around the world. Uh, we're building open source software. The valuation of that work is changing too, whereas maybe 10 years ago, this was seen as a side project, a hobby maybe even, not something you would um, kind of get value for in a promotion case. That's massively changing right now. And many of the people in my generation are considering tool building to be one of the primary aspects of their work. Um, this is also exciting because it means when we do research, we develop new algorithms, we basically kind of pour them into packages, libraries that can be downloaded with one click or with one uh, stroke on a keyboard. So it also makes the uh, dissemination of knowledge and of science much faster, much easier. Uh, here an example that I did together with my former uh, research assistant, Chin Chin Chen, uh, who's now at Buffalo. I'll try to point out some of these collaborators that I've had over the past, because certainly this was not all me, right? That science very much is a team sport. So the first one, software building. 
I think very, will be very important uh, for the next 10 years in, in geography. The second, and coming more to the heart of, of science, is using all of this new data to answer very classic questions. And in human geography, you almost cannot go more classic than Chris Stoller's central place theory, which many of the geographers here might, might recognize. And I won't go into the details, but the idea basically being that when we look at a country's pattern of cities, we see kind of a regular structure. We often have one large uh, national capital, and then in the several provinces, we have kind of provincial capitals. And when we look around the provincial capitals, we have a series of smaller towns, etc. Uh, so this is a very old theory, comes from the 1930s. Um, but it was always difficult to empirically, quote unquote, prove that theory, um, because it needs a lot of data. Now, some of our colleagues in the 1960s here in Leuven have tried. Again, this is from these old uh, issues of uh, our Acta Geographica journal. Um, and just to get an appreciation of the work that goes, even a simple map that we see here on the right, which basically shows the density of shops and services in each municipality in East Flanders. Um, if you read the quote, and for those of us who read uh, Dutch, I guess I will translate the last sentence. Uh, so they basically go out and spend an entire summer in 1960 collecting the exact locations of all these shops and services, but gladly uh, they received a lot of help from both the local police and the local sheriff. So you can kind of imagine, right? It takes a whole summer just to collect uh, some locations of shops. So how can we use new data sets to maybe shine some light on these types of questions? Um, this is one example from some work I did with Michiel van Metre, uh, now at Utrecht University, where we use a whole bunch of different data sets. Now, first of all, we don't need to count the shops anymore by hand. We have pre-existing databases for that. But what we also have is social media platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, where people actually volunteer a lot of information. Uh, they're standing in line for their coffee and they're tweeting, I'm standing in line for my coffee. And that information, we can actually use that as basically proof that a person went somewhere and consumed a certain surface. They consumed a coffee, they went to the jewelry store and said, I'm going to propose to my fiance. Uh, and then again, we can use that as a proxy for particular types of consumptions. And with that information, if we aggregate that for an entire city, we can actually finally put empirical proof under that original theory that Walter Christeller came up with in the 1930s. And what we, for example, see, and this makes logical sense uh, in the case of, this is in um, Kentucky in the United States. So what we see is that the drugstore, you see all the way in the bottom left, basically meaning that people are not really willing to travel all that far to the drugstore. The drugstore here is kind of a, like a corner store if you supermarkets people are traveling a little bit further to but then all the way in the top right of course we see the jewelry store the clothing store etc now this makes logical sense you can think on your own life and you do this probably as well you don't travel 15 kilometers just to get a croissant at the, at the bakery uh, but now we can finally analyze it we can finally measure it just some other examples this is work to, uh, done together with Taylor Shelton and, and Matt Zook, where we study the process of gentrification. And gentrification is basically the idea that neighborhoods in a city can oftentimes change and shift to get a different character. So it can go from a relatively poor neighborhood to relatively rich neighborhood. And seemingly this happens over a very short period of time sometimes. And researchers and policymakers can be baffled by this. Like how, how could this have happened so fast? Often by the time we do a census 10 years later, the process is done. So it is very kind of difficult to, to measure with traditional means, with surveys, with census, etc. What we do here, we use the same Twitter data set, um, but we look at how people travel throughout the city. Um, and then we don't look at necessarily where people live, because that's what we normally get from a census or a, a survey, but we look at where do they go to. So we don't look at the changes in residence in a neighborhood, but we look at the changes of the profile of the visitors. And that's often one of the first indications that a neighborhood is changing. All of a sudden, a different type of person, a different subgroup of the population, 
starts to visit the neighborhood, different shops will then come in to cater to that different audience, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how the ball gets rolling. And indeed, uh, with this, uh, we are able to show these early signs of change. Finally, um, another example done together with Anirudh Govind, who's also present today uh, because he recently joined us as a PhD student, which I think is an incredibly exciting example of using different types of data sources. So here we're not using social media data. This is not data generated by phones. Uh, here we are in Karachi, Pakistan. And one of the challenges in a city like Karachi and in many other cities around the world is that it's really difficult to find data on a granular spatial level. We might be able to get data at a provincial level or at the city level and know more or less how many people live there, what is their socioeconomic characteristics, et cetera. But at the neighborhood level, that data is very rare because it's very difficult and expensive to collect. What we do here is we use a little bit of a creative trick. Uh, we use a proxy, namely energy losses. And what are these energy losses? It's literally the process that you see there, um, people hooking on to the main energy lines to basically, quote unquote, steal energy. What that does is it creates a discrepancy between the number of kilowatt hours built and the number of kilowatt hours consumed in each neighborhood, because every neighborhood will have a transformer station. We use that information as a proxy for urban governance and for social economic development at a very granular level, which you would have never thought if you think about sort of energy consumption and big energy corporations, that this could potentially be used for social research. And that is one of the exciting things about all of this new data, all of these new methods, that it kind of opens the possibilities, it opens the frontier. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about is going even a little bit forward, further, pushing the envelope and looking at, for example, the use of simulation, uh, which is heavily used in, in climate science, in the physical side of geography as well, uh, but not so much in human geography. Usually we kind of look back, but we don't simulate forwards. Um, and this is also a very personal uh, example. I've been living in Brussels now for a year and a half. Every time we propose to take away some parking spots or build a bike lane somewhere, um, we get this type of response. Uh, basically, the local residents will come up, the local merchants will come up and say, oh, no, no, you cannot do that because we will lose customers and there will be traffic jams everywhere. But this is not based on science. It's not studied at all. It's just a feeling people have. Um, what if we actually had the tools to very quickly and very cheaply simulate these kind of scenarios? Uh, and there's lots of exciting work uh, in this field. Uh, on the bottom right, you see a screenshot, animated screenshot from a tool called AB Streets, where ba that basically allows you to go anywhere in the world and based on open data, it will generate simulated traffic patterns and you can change the roads or build a bike lane somewhere or build a new, it's like SimCity, but for real. Um, so that's uh, a very exciting aspect. Now, my third point, um, is about visualization. And this too, I think is very important. We get more data, our models getting complexer and complexer, uh, but the more complexity we bring in, the more important it becomes to visualize our data. And why is that? Because models abstract away so much of that complexity that we might miss very important details. This is a, a reinvention of a classic uh, statisticians and SCOMPS coordinates for people who know it. Uh, what we see here, this is dubbed a datasaurus and we'll see a dinosaur, going back to geology again, pop up in a minute. Uh, all of these points that we see here, they have the exact same mean, the exact same standard deviation, and also the exact same correlation coefficient. So if you would, with a model, right, with a statistical number, summarize the distributions of these two variables, you would always get the exact same number. But when we visualize, we see immediately that these are very different variables. They're very different point distributions. So a nice visual reminder of why we should visualize. Now we started doing that more and more. Um, so on the left, you see an example of kind of a 
uh, sidecar uh, website. Uh, these are the types of things that we start building next to our academic articles to allow uh, readers to explore the data uh, by themselves. Uh, we see, for example, in machine learning, where we often deal with really complex algorithms, that even specialized journals are popping up that are no longer published on paper, but are only online and are specifically in the form of interactive articles, where you can explore algorithms step by step in much detail. But we can go further too uh, and even build entire platforms where we can allow not only researchers but also policymakers to engage directly with the data and the models that we are creating. And I think this especially is very promising for the next 10 years. If I look in our hallways right now, it is literally filled with reports and reports that we wrote for government agencies to study one particular question. Six months later, we turn around and we do it with updated data. That's no longer necessary if we build our data and our models into these interactive platforms. And finally, um, and then I will conclude because I know I'm standing in between you and the reception, is education. I think a lot of what I've talked about today feeds directly into education. For example, software building. I teach a course on interactive data visualization to our students. Now it happens to be that interactive data visualization is extremely complicated because most of the tools are built for engineers and computer scientists, not for geographers. Uh, so what we did, coming back to software development, we built a library specifically tailored for interactive data visualization, but then for geographers, right? So we can do that when we start building our own tools. On the right, we see, again, linking to geology, I'm really uh, good at that apparently today. Um, we see um, a primary school textbook uh, but no longer a textbook, but an iPad application where students don't only have to read the static text, but can play uh, with some of the concepts being introduced. Now, this happens a lot more in primary school education, but there's lots of potential to bring this to university education as well. We're still explaining complicated things like projections in cartography, by textbooks that are static. Um, so I would like to change that. Uh, but most importantly, I think computational thinking and software development should really be an integral part of geography. Whereas in the past, it has sometimes been outsourced to the computer science department or to the statistics department. Uh, I think that creates a different type of geography. They're really integrated. They're two parts of one whole. So with that, um, I will conclude again by showing the cartographatron, uh, because I think what we can learn from that is the kind of initial excitement, uh, but it is also maybe a little bit of a memento to not make some of the same mistakes. So to not go overboard and not forget geography when we are using computers and vice versa. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Arthur, for your <laughs> lecture. Uh, is there an urgent question for Arthur? Yeah, <laughs> yes. So, thanks again, Arthur, and also Anouk, for giving your inaugural lecture. Uh, and then I would like to invite everyone uh, to the reception, uh, which will take place downstairs. So. Um, and there you will have enough opportunities to have a chat with our new colleagues. So enjoy it. Thank you again.